Hey, it's Sam, and I'm going to talk about March and the important astrology configurations, Vedic astrology configurations for March. Now, one of the main things that we need to know is that we're going to have important um, a lunar eclipse in March on March 20th. Um, it's going to be the on the new moon in Pisces, um, and so that's really a time to connect with your more sort of metaphysical, creative uh, life um, that also includes things that take you into the past lives and dream experiences and really connecting with that deep subconscious hidden part of life. I'll talk about it when I get there, but you want to realize that's one of the big features of March is this uh, lunar eclipse in Pisces. Um, and um, so there are, you know, there are also many other things to talk about, so let's just get going. March 1st through the 3rd will start with the Moon in Cancer join Jupiter, so this is going to expand through the heart, really connect to our teachings and gurus and higher wisdom through the heart. March 1st through the 3rd, um, really a good time for you to get clear about your teachings. You might feel a confusion or maybe even changing teachers or, you know, sort of reversing some direction with your teachings or teachers at that time because Jupiter is also retrograde. You want to really check in with your heart, make sure that you're certain before you do something like that um, instead of doing something confusing. Um, on March 5th, the moon will go into Leo. We'll, or I'm sorry, we'll have the full moon in Leo on March 5th. Um, and the full moons, you know, they provide this contrast, um, this balancing point to the new moon phase. The moon is was new in Aquarius, so we're actually dealing with the Aquarius cycle right now, which means the sun is in Aquarius, so the full moon in Leo provides a contrast point to that. And, you know, as the moon gets closer to being full and gets closer to March 5th, we can feel a kind of more sort of willful personal nature, which is to bring into contrast the natural, um, I guess you would say, service or accommodating nature of Aquarius. Aquarius is where we want to serve a higher cause. So we're all looking at higher purposes, higher causes, and even things like legacies, how we're going to leave the earth, whether we're going to leave it better than we found it. Um, we have been for the last couple of weeks, and the point of contrast in Leo shows where our individual will has to be aligned with our you know, sense of purpose and legacy. Otherwise, we feel like a servant rather than feeling enthusiastic about showing up to serve. So these are important things that we'll be um, paying attention to, especially as we get closer to that full moon on March 5th. Then we have this stressful period between March 7th and March 12th where the moon is going to be joined either Malefic Rahu in Virgo Italy, or be hemmed between Rahu and Saturn or join Saturn in Scorpio. So this is set up for the next year or so um, where we'll have Rahu the North Node in Virgo and Saturn in Libra and so the moon is going to be hitting you know either joined one of them or hemmed between them for about five days uh, to a week and that's going to happen March 7th through the 12th. So notice March 7th through the 12th, you may feel um, some sort of exaggerated emotions. March 7th and 8th with Moon Rahu and some stress around details. March 9th and 10th with the Moon Hemmed, you may feel um, where those distortions lead to sort of fear of consequences. And then March 11th and 12th, there may be some sort of stasis and you may feel kind of stuck around things. And also, that could be some of the heavier days because the moon will also be debilitated in Scorpio. So especially March 11th and 12th, moon in Scorpio, join Saturn. You want to kind of maybe sort of camp out and hang out and notice that it might be some heavy emotional times, but not to get too sucked into it and, you know, not to get too depressed um, at that time. Then on March 14th, Saturn is going to turn retrograde in Scorpio, where it's going to be retrograde until August 1st. Now, Saturn's retrograde close to half the time, so Saturn has been in Scorpio since um, it's since um, like September of this year, and uh, I believe it was September. Um, and when he goes retrograde, we we get to reflect on 
those lessons. Now he's been re retrograde since, or I'm sorry, he's been in Scorpio since September of this year. So it's a time for us to really notice how those long-term plans and commitments have shifted since September 2014 when Saturn went into Scorpio. You should notice a kind of shift that happened around that time with your duties, commitments, pressures that you're willing to handle, pressures that you want to let go of. All of those things are um, very ripe right now. Um, and then when Saturn goes retrograde on March 1st until August 1st, we'll be reflecting upon those things and making sure that's where we want to um, commit our energy and put our focus. So again, Saturn's retrograde half the time. We're supposed to be reflecting on those things about half the time and then making adjustments. So um, you'll notice that um, March um, 14th, I might have said March 1st, March 14th, um, but even as it leads up to that, you know, really almost all of March we're going to start to feel because Saturn's going to slow down in the sky. And when he slows down, it starts to really concentrate and build up before he goes retrograde. And then March 16th and 17th, um, we're going to see the moon in Capricorn where it's going to be aspected by both Jupiter and Saturn. could be a good day to really clarify what those new commitments and hopes are going to be. Like I said, when Saturn actually starts to turn retrograde on March 14th, he's actually stationary retrograde, which he just kind of stops in the sky. March 16th and 17th, with the Moon and Saturn's sign and aspected by both Saturn and Jupiter, we may start to really um, recalibrate what these commitments are about, what they mean, where they could be taking us on a larger scale. So it's not just about um, you know, something abstract, especially with the um, aspect of Jupiter also, it's to really align us with higher teachings, higher principles, and wisdom. And then the other aspect from Saturn himself gives us the concentration to really commit to that future that we want to create based on those hopes and teachings and optimism. And then, as I say, March 20th, the first solar eclipse 2015 happens on this new moon in Pisces. And it's joined Mars and K2. This is where Sun... Moon, Mars, and K2, the South Node, are all joined in eclipse, uh, joined in Pisces. Um, and this eclipse shows, it's actually the Sun being eclipsed by the South Node. So each eclipse has something different just in, as it relates to which node is eclipsed and which, or I'm sorry, which node is doing the eclipsing and which luminary is being eclipsed. So the Sun being eclipsed by K2 shows um, certainly a um, concentration of power based on this sort of genius of the past. It's an awakening of sacred knowledge from the past and reclaiming that sacred knowledge and sacred teaching. Particularly, this is why the K2 and Pisces Rahu through Virgo axis is very powerful because, you know, the nodes do really well here. K2 and Pisces is already giving us access to a lot of um, mastery that we carry over from past lives into this lifetime. We access a lot of this in the dream space as well. It's easy to notice where our relationship with past lives and time as a sort of liquid concept is much more noticeable in Pisces. Um, I don't really, as a rule, generally like to focus on past lives because it seems very disconnected, except when we talk about K2 because it literally shows the mastery that we come into this lifetime with. And Pisces is the sign that connects us to that metaphysical in-between life state. We also see that in the dream state. Um, and in states of meditation and awareness, I also think sometimes people get too, like, you know, kind of woo-woo about, you know, the dream state. Um, of course, it can be helpful, and we're, and we're definitely working through our karma in our dreams, but making the dream, you know, conscious is really the thing, and the way to make the dream conscious is the more healthy qualities of Pisces, which is through meditation, introspection, and really connecting with that astral body. The astral body, when we fall asleep and then it kind of explodes, comes out in our dreams, but we can approach it consciously through meditation. It's the same body. So um, what happens is when we get the eclipse, though, this K2 is going to eclipse the sun, which is our power source, and temporarily throw it into darkness, where we're temporarily sort of like blind, because K2 is blind. He doesn't have a head. And so, again, it can be very you know, difficult um, in certain signs, but when it's in Pisces, Pisces is where we're also not really, you know, it's like the sign of the ocean where we can't really see anyway, where we need to trust our intuition. So that kind of, that sort of idea of the sun, which is, we typically experience as our 
light being projected out into the world, having it sort of darkened and, you know, called into question, um, makes us connect to whatever the environment is. And in this case, it's Pisces, um, which is that really intuitive, emotional, metaphysical union with all. So it can really be, it can lead to a lot of um, sort of dharmic understanding, but it can also lead to escapism, you know, drugs, fantasy, impure connections to um, all of those things. We usually have a kind of impure relationship with, you know, you know, basically um, everything until we transform it. And the difficult quality of Pisces is escapism. I mean, if it wasn't, everybody would be meditating. How many people sit and actually really go into their meditation with a lot of depth? When they're feeling upset and angry, they go into meditation. We usually don't do that. We usually, we usually want to escape from it into some kind of distraction, especially in this world now. We escape into things like movies and entertainment and the internet and even just kind of like dumping it on somebody or, ch you know, chatting about it, gossiping about it. Anyway, all that stuff. So the healthy option is to really connect with that otherworldly space. Now, it's in the Nakshadra of Uttara Bhadrapada, which is... Uh, the deity is called um, Ahibudnya, who is the celestial serpent who goes down and removes that last bit of dirt, that last bit of dirt that's blocking the soul's evolution. Um, and so it's a great time to sort of dig deeply into our, you know, psychological weaknesses. And Mars is also there, so he gives a lot of courage to do so as well. So that March 20th eclipse, I'll talk more about it later. I'll do a whole thing on it, but that's going to be big, as I said. And then the last big feature of the month, March 24th and 25th, the moon will be exalted in Taurus. Nice to have the moon exalted in Taurus. And it's going to be a great time to really maybe integrate some of the, you know, potential confusion that came from the eclipse. Because the eclipse, of course, it's happening in Pisces. But it's a time when we might just be sort of, you know, we might be meditating and whatnot, but we're not really processing or integrating much. A couple days later, 24th and 25th, when the moon goes into Taurus, it's really good for integration. So they, they could be some good days for meditation um, also at that time. And it's also good for connecting with family and friends and, and you know, your deep connections and bonds. So March looks pretty interesting um, overall. And actually, the end of the month, the moon's going to rejoin Jupiter. Um, Mer I'm sorry, um, Jupiter moon will again join in Cancer. So the month will end like it began with moon, Jupiter, and Cancer. But... I hope this is helpful. Share this with others and have a great March.